Thank you, Mary. Good morning. Uh, we have a small handful of announcements this morning. We are green on the screens and white down here because we have not yet changed our decorations. So we need you to stay after worship as you can to help undeck the halls um, and put Christmas and Advent decorations away. Uh, Health ministry would normally meet this week. They've bumped their meeting to next week, to next Monday, for health ministry at 4.30 on Monday the 23rd, followed by cancer support group. Prayer group is going to meet um, as scheduled for the next several Tuesdays. Annual meeting of the congregation is for February 5th, um, after worship. And then our celebration of Super Bowl with the O in it. Um, is on the 12th, which is Super Bowl Sunday, but uh, be ready to hear more about that in the coming weeks as well. Do we have other announcements this morning? Hang on. I'd like to ask for a volunteer to sweep the driveway of the pesty little um, gumballs. gumballs, especially the handicapped section. Okay. So we have lots of gumballs out there. So if we have a volunteer, a high school student in need of community service hours, any of those sorts of things, somebody who is likely not to trip and fall on the gumballs, please. Um, that is a task for the week ahead that would be great. Are there others? <laughs> uh, uh, this Friday morning, about 9.30 in the morning, I got a call from Marion Water Office that we had a leak. I came up here and I traveled through the whole building about five times and never did find the leak. Finally, the guy came out about one o'clock and said the leak has stopped. But I don't know where it was, but it's probably one of the one of the toilets in in the new section over there have a tendency for the float not to close and and the water keeps running and running and running. But we've also had trouble in the men's room urinals too with them running. So if you happen to see water or hear water running after you've used the facilities, please uh, make a note of it and try to get it stopped or let me know or something because that's a lot of water. It's 30 gallons an hour for, for a half a week, so that's a bunch. So I appreciate it if you... And when he says try to stop it, he means jiggle the handle, not get out the wrenches. <laughs> You don't, you don't want to happen what happened to me in the, in the men's, old men's room one time. <laughs> the bro pipe broke and we had to shut all the water off to get it. Minimal interference and then contact Tom. <laughs> Are there others? Let's worship God. Hakuna mungu kama wewe, hakuna mungu kama wewe, hakuna mungu kama wewe, hakuna na hata koepo. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus, there's no one, there's no one like him. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. I've searched and searched all over, over. I've turned and turned all over, over. I've walked and walked all over, over. There's no one, there's no one like him. Hakuna mungu kama wewe. Hakuna mungu kama wewe. Hakuna mungu kama wewe. Hakuna na hata koepo Ne metembe a kote, kote Ne metafuta kote, kote Le bezungu ka kote, kote Hakuna na hata koepo There's no one, there's no one like Jesus 
There's no one, there's no one like him. There's no one, there's no one like Jesus. There's no one, there's no one like him. Hakuna mungu kama wewe. Hakuna mungu kama wewe. Hakuna mungu kama wewe. Hakuna na hata kuepo. Hakuna mungu kama wewe. Hakuna mungu kama wewe. Hakuna mungu kama wewe. Hakuna na hata kuepo. There's no one other way to Hakuna na hata kuepo. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Even when we feel alone in the wilderness, we worship you and serve only you. Despite the temptations life may throw at us, we worship you and serve only you. As we comp contemplate the path ahead, we worship you and serve only you wherever it may lead. Amen. Our hymn of praise is number 175, Seek Ye First. I sound good this morning. <laughs> the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Let us confess our sin to God. Forgive us, God, for leading ourselves astray and pretending somehow we are the victims and not the culprits. Forgive us for appealing to our frailty, as if somehow, just by saying we need face, no charge for our own culpability. Forgive us for hungering what we do not need, and for thirsting what will not satisfy. When the feast is already offered to us, the bread of life and living water, Forgive the rootedness we welcome in traditions that bind us when faith spells liberation. Forgive us for kissing the cheek of power instead of the hand of righteousness when the world cries out for justice. May we know your forgiveness in our hearts and be transformed and cleansed, a new beginning for the temptations we have known. Okay. 
The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. To all who have received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. be seated. We do not have a minute for mission today, so we'll go straight to our ministry of music. Right. 
eye of the poor. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Blessed be the We are in the fourth chapter of Matthew's Gospel this week. We're picking up exactly where we left off last week. So nothing has happened since the baptism of Jesus, the clouds opening up, the dove descending, and the booming voice saying, This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, All of these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came And waited on him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to God. Friends, our next hymn is number 167, 40 Days and 40 Nights. We're going to continue. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, for the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has drawn near. 
Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'm going to start with a very bad pun. You're going to groan, and then we're going to move on. Our scripture passage is, the devil went down to Jordan. He was looking for a soul to steal. (laughs) There is so much in this passage that we just want to skip. We want to pretend as though the template for our faith does not move directly from baptism to being tempted by the devil. We want to pretend there is no such thing as the devil a lot of the time. And we don't even want to read that little part where it's the spirit that drives Jesus out into the wilderness. We want to believe that like these are temptations we will never face. And so we don't really have to take this passage seriously. We can just move on to where Jesus is doing Jesus-y things and the devil is not involved. We would miss a lot if we did that. This passage hearkens to many other texts in Scripture. There's 40 days and 40 nights, which is the amount of time of rain in one of the Noah stories. It's 40 years in the wilderness. It's often considered 40 to be that Biblical metaphor for it was a really, really long time. It's understood that 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, that's a contrast to normal ritual fasting. Normally you fast during the day and then you eat at night um, so that you make it through. This is very specific. Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and that is enough to bring you to the brink of death. Historically, the church has held that Jesus was scourged 39 times at the crucifixion because 40 would kill you. So here we have Jesus in the wilderness, again, kind of hanging out right on that line between life and death. And if you or a family member have ever been hanging on right at the line of life and death, you know that's a great time for the devil to come in and start making promises which is what happens in the story. It would make a great Snickers commercial. You're not yourself when you're hungry, Jesus. So the devil says, hey, there's all these rocks. Why don't you just get a snack, convert one of them to bread, convert many of them to bread, do whatever. If you're the son of God, this should really be no big deal for you. You should be able to do this. Jesus comes back quickly with a scripture quote, uh, we don't live by bread alone, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. I'm not going to do it. So the devil then comes back and says, oh, you like quoting scripture. I got a scripture verse for you too. How about, let's see exactly what he says. How about just let's go to the top of the temple and just jump. It'll be fine because scripture says, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so you do not dash your foot against the stone. I know my choir members here have that ringing in their ears. Again, the devil starts with if, but I think for the devil it's not an if. He knows full well who he's talking to. And we see that throughout the Gospels is that Folks on the opposite side know exactly who Jesus is. Unclean spirits, they know exactly who Jesus is. The devil knows exactly who Jesus is. Even the Romans sort of get who Jesus is. This time, Jesus has another set of scripture verses ready to come back. We move from the wilderness to the top of the temple, and one of those big theological questions that the Bible is no help at all in answering is like the one at the end of last week's lesson. Who else sees and hears the clouds open up and the dove descend? Who sees these two people at the top of the temple having a conversation? I would like to think if I was going into the temple and I saw two people perched on the very top of it, I would think that was something weird. We don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. What what the devil asked Jesus to do is exactly in Jesus' mission, to give up his life. But it's not just to give up his life to showboat. 
that he is the Son of God and have the angels come in and rescue him. You may remember that's one of the lines from the foot of the cross to Jesus on the cross. Is, if you are the Son of God, have him have his angels bring you down. should also be a good reminder that even the devil knows how to quote scripture. So just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean you need to be paying attention to it the way the person speaking thinks you should. The last one, and I know it's going to surprise you terribly to find out there are three temptations here, is a bit different. And one of the things we talked about in Sunday school is how we read the tone of the devil's voice here really matters. So this is one of those passages where the devil can be, I kind of imagine him as a used car salesman. He already knows what the lowest price he can sell this car for is, and he's just pretending he's going to go back to talk to the manager. He already knows that Jesus has the power and the glory over every nation on earth. But if he can make Jesus worship him just to sell it, he's going to do it. Clint brought up that perhaps this is a time for a whining, sniveling devil's last chance. If you would, please, Jesus, if you, if you would just fall down and worship me, then you could have all this stuff, and it would be great, and it would be awesome, and it, it would really help me meet my monthly metrics for s s souls stolen. That would be great, Jesus, if you could do that. Jesus, again, has an answer, again, an answer that will resonate to a time, again, when he's on top of a mountain and being asked to just stay and rest in his glory. Away with you, Satan. After that, he hears that John is arrested and goes off, and then he starts doing very John-like things, repent, for the kingdom of God has drawn near. I think one of the things we struggle with with this passage is that we're not ready for this sort of temptation. I think that's an honest statement for most of us that we are not ready for this sort of temptation. I think it's also an honest statement that when we get tempted, it's going to come at us sideways. So Jesus is hungry. He is very, very hungry. And the first thing the devil does is appeal to his basic physical needs. And let's be honest, how many of you have ever broken a diet for that reason? Uh-huh. Well, it's the end of a long day. I didn't eat lunch. I need a snack. And that box of ding-dongs looks really good. I know I'm not supposed to eat all of them, but it just sort of happened. There were enough cookies for the whole family. But now, I really think I only had one or two. Right? I mean, that's where temptation hits us. It hits us when we are already weak. It doesn't hit us when we're strong. And it hits us on something really basic and really necessary. Jesus does need to eat. It's been 40 days. He's hungry. The next one hits Jesus, if we can say this, on, on the ego of Jesus. If you are the Son of God, prove who you are. Prove your credentials. Prove you belong. Prove you're here to transform the world. Prove that the angels care about you at all. Prove that God cares about you at all. I happen to think this is a little bit of a dramatic way to prove that. Um, but I also know that we will take any attention over no attention. I also know that there is no such thing as bad publicity. And I also know that one of the places we are at our weakest emotionally is about whether or not we are loved. And if we start questioning if we're loved, that starts undermining everything else that exists. And the devil is a pretty savvy character. He's going after Jesus on the physical. He's going after Jesus on the emotional. And the third time, he's going to go after him on the theological. When all else fails, we resort to theology. What can I say? There's no if this time. The devil doesn't say, if you are the son of God, then, then do this thing. The devil just says, all of this will be yours 
Slides an if in there, if you worship me, but it's not really conditional on the devil, is it? I mean, that's, that's the whole point of Jesus, is that this is not conditional on the devil. God is going to do this thing, and this is how this is going to be done. But I mentioned the next time they're on top of a mountain and tempted to stay for a reason, because it's not just the devil who's going to offer Jesus a chance to just stay up high to stay above the fray, to not get dirty, to not get down in the valleys and the pain and the suffering of actual human life. Just stay up here. That may shed some light on why Jesus speaks to Peter the way he speaks to Peter on the day of transfiguration. How does Jesus have these answers all so ready? Well, he's the son of God, so yes, 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 and this is who he is at his core. Every so often on TV, they do an ethics study, they put a wallet with money out on the street, and they've got a hidden camera, and they record people coming across the wallet and seeing who will take the money and who will try to return it. Usually about 60 to 70% of the people return it. That means 30 to 40% don't. Do we honestly think that decision is being made in that moment? I think that decision was made a long time prior. That when it comes to that moment, we have a reflex based on who we are at the core of our being and the story on how we got here. We may have different chapters in that, that once I was struggling and I lost stuff and I went to, you know, I went back to Lost and Found and there was everything. Somebody had turned it all in and how could I not do that? We may have the flip side of the story that I lost my wallet and yeah, I got turned into the police department and I spent the next three years sorting out identity theft for my credit cards. I am not putting another human being through that. You know, we, we all have stories on how we get there, but I think ultimately we do what we do because of who we are at the core. Jesus' answers come out of who Jesus is, and our answers to temptation come out of that very same place. In the moment we make a decision, but it has often been made long before then. I've done a ton of funerals for folks who survived the Great Depression, and they all had something in their house that they had way too many of. Paper clips? Rubber bands that didn't stretch anymore because they were literally 70 years old. Newspapers. Aluminum foil that had been used and washed and used and washed and used and washed. They weren't making a decision every time they baked a casserole. I should really... Get the tin foil off, flatten it out, run it through the sink. That's not a decision they're making every time. It's, I really need to hoard my tin foil. Coming out of a very solid, very real experience of scarcity, those patterns got set for their lives. That is why it is fundamentally important in the life of faith when we answer those baptismal questions that we follow through on them, both as the individuals being baptized, or the parents, often in the Presbyterian church, and the congregation. Because those things in the first days set the tone and set the pattern for how we will live the rest of the time. It's hard. I mean, for years I have watched people try to come back to church because the first lessons they got in church 
were often that they were not welcome. Even as their Sunday school class was singing, Jesus loves the little children of the world. That they didn't have the right shoes, they didn't love the right people, their skin was the wrong color. That they couldn't say 100% that they were sure about their faith because their life was hard and they had questions and doubts. And they had been taught that church wasn't for them and God wasn't for them. And if you had doubts, you didn't belong. And if you look like that, you don't belong. And if you live like that, you don't belong. And at some other point, they needed to come back. Something was missing. Something they didn't know where they could find anywhere else. But they looked everywhere else, so they might as well try church. And those first moments of walking back into church, the reflexes of that church on how to greet and how to welcome and how to make space are what decides whether folks stay or go, whether they think nothing has changed or they think everything has changed, whether they think the love of God is real and it could be for them or whether God isn't really interested in them. And that is, that is ultimately the challenge of being the body of Christ, is building those reflexes. Not on the theology. We can do theology all day. That's why you give me hey, 15, 20, 25, 35, 45 minutes, whatever I want on a Sunday morning to do theology. That's a lot longer than we have in an encounter. That's so much longer than we have in an encounter. In an encounter, people don't need the theology. They need the presence of Jesus Christ. And that is what the devil gets. And what he's so disappointed by is the presence. The real, the true, the unfaking, the not having to think about it, the not deliberating, not I'll get back to you with an answer on that faith of Jesus Christ in who he is and who God is. And that, that is what the world wants to see. That is what the world needs to see. In the moment, the very moment is where God's love transforms the world. It's not in, I'll call you back later, let me check the church budget. It's not in, oh, I had a great answer 15 minutes afterwards. It's in, in the moment. It's there in a very tight snapshot. And our challenge as the body of Christ is both to work to build those reflexes in ourselves and to teach them to one another, to our community, to our world. Some of us have faster reflexes than others. Some of us have better reflexes than others. There's part of the uh, Huckleberry Finn story where they are going down the river on their raft. It's actually Tom Sawyer, I think. It's Tom and Jim, and Tom is dressed up as, as a girl. And the woman that he's trying to fool drops a ball of yarn. And he slams his legs together. And she says, now I know you're not a girl, son. Any girl wearing a dress would have let the dress catch it. Right? The reflexes of the moment are both what gives us away and what proclaims who we are in the very moment. So as we go forward this year, how finely tuned are our reflexes? What do we have good reflexes for and what do we need to work on our reflexes about? And how are we in the very moment of ministry when it all matters? Perhaps not to us, but the person we're speaking to, holding hands with, texting, whatever it is. How are our reflexes in that moment identifying us 
as children of the one true and living God. To God alone be the glory this day and forevermore. Amen. Friends, we will respond by affirming our faith using some very, very old words of the Apostles' Creed. Please join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, let us respond to the good news heard and proclaimed by giving our tithes and offerings. And as we do that, begin gathering your prayer requests together. Friends, let us give and receive our morning offering. may be seated. Friends, this past week has seen famous deaths of people too young to die, we think. People whose parents we know, and so their fame we know. That's not the only families that are grieving this week in the world. Those are not the only folks who are struggling. Um, They just grab the headlines. Our friends in California are struggling with torrential rain with landslides, with loss of electricity and drinking water and wonders about can, can they ever go back, can they ever rebuild, um, loss of home, loss of family. Um, we have been through winter storms. War rages on in Ukraine. There is much to be at prayer about in our world. What would you like to lift up today? All right, are there others? Will you pray with me? God, we come to you this day, and it is a small comfort often to know that you have been tempted as we are, and yet it comes up time and time again. Your full humanity, your full divinity set the stage for how we are to be in the world, and they give us a glimpse at how you would do things differently from how we do them. 
You are the great physician. You know that we need healing. And you often provide healing that cannot be found in any other way. For friends and neighbors who need healing and health, we ask you to be present with them. You are the good shepherd. You guide us through so many things. We are often stubborn sheep who do not go where you follow. Continue to guide us. Continue to call us, O God, and lead us in your paths of righteousness. You are the light of the world. John says that often we prefer darkness, but you are the light of the world. And when we go without that light in the winter, we struggle. And when we go without that light the rest of our lives, we struggle as well. We ask you once more to be the light that shines in the darkness, that the darkness cannot overcome in our lives. God, we come to you this day with so many things on our hearts and minds. Our neighbors are struggling. They're longing for peace. They're longing for safety. They're longing for food and shelter. They're longing for their loved ones to do better. All the same things we long for. So as we pray for our own, O God, let us expand that prayer to all of your own. And let us pray as Christ teaches us, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Friends, we will go out singing number 87, Comfort, Comfort Now My People.
Friends, as we go, don't sneak out too quickly. We do need to undecorate the church. As we mark the end of the Advent and Christmas season, we are also beginning to mark the end of my season as minister here. You'll hear more from the session in the days and weeks ahead, but my time in ministry is drawing to a close, and I would ask you to pray for me and pray for the church as a whole over the days and weeks and months ahead. Now, friends, as you go, may you go remembering what we heard at the end of last week's scripture passage, that you are beloved children of God, and may that be your reflex that outcompetes all other reflexes. Greed or fear or doubt or shame or wonder, may that be the reflex that guides how you live and move in this world. Friends, go and may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us and abide with us this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen, 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 amen.